Thank you very much, Camilla. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for your interest in this panel, and uh, welcome and thank you to all of those of you who are watching online as well. Um, of course, I, all, I hope that all of you have already read the report, but if you haven't, um, I hope you will do so soon. Uh, but I thought nonetheless that what I would do uh, over the next few minutes was just to give you a bit of an overview of the report itself, but also you know, to engage in a discussion actually about the rationale behind <laughs> why we thought it, it would be an interesting um, report to do, uh, an interesting uh, research project to undertake. And in fact, uh, the idea of uh, conducting a study looking at not so much the um, actual practice of BBB, but actually, or Build Back Better, um, short-term BBB, uh, but actually looking at the discourse around it, this idea actually came about um, in a discussion that Simon and I had, uh, in fact, in 2011, beginning of 2011 in Haiti, um, when we first met. And, and we were talking really about, um, you know, this, the prevalence of this, uh, this term, how it was being used in Haiti, and discussing the different ways in which it was being used uh, in, in other disaster uh, contexts. And I was very familiar with Aceh. I'd been working there for uh, many years, engaged both uh, prior to the tsunami, but also then working uh, in the post-tsunami context. Um, and it was very clear that there was this term that had become so popular, um, but actually meant incredibly different things to different actors, um, some of who knew the context uh, in which they were working very well, and some of, in fact, some who didn't know the context in which they were working in quite so well, but still yet had this conviction that you know there was a way to build back better and that building back better meant certain types of things. So we thought, in fact, that an interesting um, approach to take to trying to unpack uh, this term would be to try to look at the way a single term, concept if you like, has in fact been used in uh, very many different ways in uh, several different post-disaster contexts and sort of what that's come to mean. Um, so I'll, I'll say a little bit first as well about what the report isn't. It's not an evaluation of you know, post-disaster uh, projects or a scorecard of you know, who did build back better and who didn't. Um, it's, it isn't looking to try to develop a new definition of what build back better is, uh, nor is it looking to formulate guidelines of how, how you do actually build back better and how you implement a, a kind of a build back better approach. I mean, in fact, there have been um, propositions of what building back better means, and those have been developed, uh, in fact, by the former special envoy for tsunami recovery, President Bill Clinton, former President Bill Clinton. Um, and that's referenced in the report, and it's also critiqued in the report, because uh, we felt it didn't quite go far enough in really talking specifically about what was actually quite unique. I mean, a lot of the propositions are incredibly useful, but they're actually not very new. So there was nothing very specific, in fact, about uh, what was being proposed as a Build Back Better approach. A lot of it was, in fact, good practice. Um, you know, what you see in, in um, a lot of sort of, you know, best practice, lessons learned uh, types of reports uh, in general. So not very much that was particularly specific, although a lot of it was quite uh, good practice. So what we tried to do in the report was really, in fact, contribute to developing a bit more of an analytical base around uh, this idea of Build Back Better through an examination of the discourse around Build Back Better in three case studies, where this term figured prominently. Um, so we chose uh, these case studies, uh, the province of Aceh in Indonesia, um, Myanmar and Haiti, for several reasons. Uh, partly, I have to say, because I was very familiar with all three of them, having worked there, but also because all three were large-scale disasters. Um, all three suffered from multiple problems, uh, already prior to these disasters, um, including uh, armed conflict in Aceh, chronic poverty, in fact, in all three uh, locations, weak public institutions, um, lack of civ civic space. Um, and all three experienced a diverse range of actors, institutional arrangements, and levels of funding as part of the post-disaster operations. So the, the report uh, was based on close to 50 interviews um, over the period of uh, about a year and a half, um, a desk study and also, of course, observations that um, I had made in my experience working in all three of those contexts over um, a number of years. So on the surface, the aspiration to build back better 
uh, you know, to use disasters, in fact, as an opportunity to leave societies not just restored but actually improved seems really just like common sense. Um, it seems almost irresponsible not to think um, of, of doing so. Um, and this might be one of the reasons it's actually become such a popular term and has been taken up in so many post-disaster contexts, uh, from Aceh to Kashmir, from Haiti to, to Takloba, in fact. Uh, we hear this term being used in um, the post uh, Haiyan uh, response currently. Um, but actually, the term BBB really does uh, raise, a, in fact, a whole host of uncomfortable questions for the humanitarian community, uh, which have yet to be properly addressed. And those include the questions of what does better actually look like? And better for whom? Uh, who decides, in fact? Is it the affected government? Uh, is it the donors? Is it humanitarian agencies? Or is it local communities affected by these disasters? How can those decisions of what better should mean, what it's meant to address, uh, actually be translated into meaningful programming? Um, is it, in fact, uh, the right thing to do to invest in building back better if it means perhaps distracting attention and even funding away from incredibly urgent and overwhelming needs to respond to humanitarian uh, needs, just to help people simply survive uh, after a disaster. Is there anything actually that's uh, common at all um, in uh, the various ways in which Build Back Better has been, has been used, and can we even really call it an approach? And what actually would it require um, if actors involved in post-disaster response were to actually take building back better seriously? Um, what are the implications of really thinking through I in a serious way about, about this approach? Um, and finally, what do these questions reveal about the current international post-disaster architecture? Um, are there ways in which the system itself, as it is designed, as it has evolved, does the system itself somehow get in the way of, in fact, uh, an effective response which, which can support transformational aspirations? Um, does the system itself sometimes uh, limit or, and restrict the kind of engagement that is needed, in fact, to bring about some of those more lasting changes? So that, those are some of the questions we tried to ask um, in these studies. So, um, I mean, I hope you'll all get a copy of the report itself and, you know, you could go through in more detail in the specific uh, case studies, but I will share a few things and a few thoughts on the case studies. Um, I mean, firstly, of course, Aceh, post-tsunami Aceh in Indonesia, this was really the place where Build Back Better really emerged as, you know, a, a very strong uh, mantra, if you like, of, of the entire reconstruction effort. And I think we all know the story about um, the tsunami. I'm sure it's uh, still, uh, you know, many of us uh, who are, are in the humanitarian community uh, were involved with many people in the general public around the world as well. Um, this obviously was uh, an unprecedented um, uh, disaster, both in terms of scale as well as in terms of the response. Um, and, uh, you know, the, the massive amounts of funding which uh, were made available post-tsunami, in fact, got a lot of uh, actors, both domestically as well as internationally, really thinking about how do we best use those funds? What can we do that's actually something more than just, um, you know, the sort of normal uh, disaster response, if you like, or emergency response? How can we use this funding in perhaps um, uh, a more sustainable way or a more transformative way? So there was a lot of thinking um, going on um, at that level. And just to give a few examples of some of the thinking that was going on with the Indonesian government, First of all, first and foremost, um, the Indonesian government actually saw the tsunami uh, in Aceh um, I mean obviously as a terrible tragedy, but also as uh, a window to, in fact, advance uh, its objectives of peace and uh, achieving peace in, in this province that had been affected for more than 30 years by a separatist conflict. Um, and it was it actually quite clear from the beginning from the Indonesian government um, that they were going to pursue the peace agenda on the back of the tsunami recovery. And two days after uh, the tsunami, the Indonesian government decided to open this province, which had been closed for, well, for years, but particularly closed um, for the 18 months prior to the tsunami, um, under civil emergency and, and martial law, in fact. Um, and they took the strategic decision to open up uh, Aceh and allow international assistance in. So that f was the first iteration, I think, the first real uh, you know, commitment to sort of saying, well, this is an opportunity to, to do something more, and in fact, it's an opportunity to build peace. 
and to really take it seriously. And, and that uh, was a commitment on all sides, both the Indonesian government as well as uh, the armed rebels, the Free Aceh movement. Um, so, so already, um, you know, reconstruction was seen as something more than just recovery, and it was seen as an opportunity to do something uh, much more significant. Um, then you had the setting up, also by the Indonesian government, of um, a special agency, a reconstruction agency, the um, Rehabilitation and Reconstruction Agency for Aceh and Nias, which uh, was a ministerial leg level agency directly under the president with a very high level of authority. This was an ad hoc agency. This was, um, you know, actually Indonesia recognizing that it did not have the institution, um, uh, an existing institution that was adequate um, and empowered enough uh, with the right types of systems to be able to manage a reconstruction effort as large as the one that was needed in Aceh. So in fact, they designed one and um, donors came behind them. You know, there was a lot of support from the international community to, um, for that government-led uh, response and, and, in fact, architecture, um, which then articulated um, Building Back Better as part of their reconstruction strategy and really explicitly defined, uh, you know, what they were doing as, you know, yes, we are reconstructing what's been damaged, but we're also really using this as an opportunity to bring in uh, to uh, bring Aceh, this province, into the fold of Indonesia. We're trying to um, ensure that, that we're bringing them out of isolation, out of poverty, that we're building trust um, you know, with, uh, between uh, Aceh and the Indonesian uh, central government, um, and at the same time using it as a way to reform the Indonesian uh, systems so that this was also a chance for Indonesia to innovate an institution that was uh, very accountable, that had um, the capacity to manage enormous amounts of funding. And if I, some of you might remember, but actually at the time of the tsunami, the um, Indonesia, in fact, was uh, regarded as one of the most corrupt countries in the world, certainly in Asia, but also in the world. So, so Indonesia also saw this as an opportunity to reform not just uh, Aceh and its relationships with Aceh, not just to pursue peace and not just to bring uh, this province out of poverty, but also to really innovate its own institutions and to reform, in fact, advance its own uh, agenda of national reform and bureaucratic reform. Um, and this is something that continues to today. In fact, the model uh, that was designed um, uh, by the Indonesian government for Aceh, for this reconstruction agency, has now been taken into the president's office within Indonesia and is you know, pushing ad advancement and reform um, across uh, uh, the country, in fact, you know, certainly at the central level, but also trying to be replicated at, at other levels in, uh, within other provinces and districts. So that's just one example of, you know, you take this one term and certainly even within the government, it means so many different things. Um, for humanitarian agencies, it meant uh, different things as well. Uh, humanitarian agencies tried to focus more on um, looking at ways in which they could really work with vulnerable communities and try to um, empower them in some ways, try to uh, look at ways of uh, advancing uh, you know, concepts like gender equality, for example, and, and, and certainly um, also sustainable livelihoods and, um, you know, a whole range of, in fact, good practice and accountability. There was a lot of uh, focus on ensuring that there was accountability to beneficiaries. So these, t these kinds of approaches, which in fact, uh, you know, they were cast in Aceh as, as part of building back better, but really you could say that actually it's good practice. It's good humanitarian practice. And, but the difference in Aceh was that they had the funding to do it. So in many um, uh, you know, responses uh, prior, you had the principles, um, but not necessarily actually the funding to implement those types of approaches. So in Aceh, the real difference was the amount of funding. Um, Myanmar was very different. Myanmar, you had, in fact, very little funding. It was um, you know, a disaster that took place uh, cyclone Nagas 2008. So this was actually at a time before this um, current wave of reform that's taken place in the Myanmar government. The sanctions uh, that many uh, Western uh, donors had uh, on Myanmar were still in place. So in fact, the um, response was not well funded at all. It was unlike Haiti and, uh, and, and Aceh. Um, and their Building Back Better didn't have quite the same kind of currency, but still it was used by certain actors to do certain things. So um, ASEAN, for example, who were um, leading uh, the coordination of the response, this is the regional organization um, in Southeast Asia, uh, they, in fact, did see part of their um, mission as being really a political mission to build the bridge between uh, Myanmar, the Myanmar government, and the international community. And so it wasn't, again, just 
well, let's make sure we get aid to the disaster affected people. It really was, this is an opportunity. This is an opportunity for us to, to, to actually build the trust, to, you know, to, number one, to show Myanmar that they can trust the international community. Um, and also to show the international community that, well, you can kind of trust, trust the Myanmar government as well. So that bridging, uh, that political bridging, was explicitly described as part of the Building Back Better approach um, by ASEAN. Um, you can read more uh, uh, about that in um, the report. Uh, but I just quickly uh, wanted to touch on Haiti, because Haiti is, I think, where you really see um, some of these contradictions play out uh, uh, quite strongly. And, and you had... You know, you had uh, an enormous amount of funding um, in Haiti, and quite uh, similar to the tsunami um, response. But you also had the same number of actors, um, <coughs> uh, similar to the tsunami response um, as well. So there was lots of aid, there was lots of commitment from donors to, you know, fund reconstruction, but you didn't actually have, um, I mean, what I argue is, you know, one of the fundamental things that you did have in, in Aceh, and Aceh that was actually the focus on uh, fundamentally trying to change certain relationships and the way in which things were being done, the way in which, um, you know, aid was being done, political relationships. In Haiti, there was not really a lot of focus on trying to change the way aid relationships worked. And, uh, you know, in, in my assessment, that was really one of the, the bottlenecks and one of the, one of the things that actually blocked um, the ability, in fact, for... Uh, um, Building Back Better, aspirations of Build Back Better to really be um, translated into something a bit more concrete. So there was recognition, you know, that, that there needed to be some kind of some kind of ownership by the Haitian government, but it didn't go quite as far as to say, well, it should be Haitian government led. And, you know, perhaps that's fair. I mean, the Haitian government was incredibly weak uh, at the time, um, and that was well recognized. Uh, but there was also, there wasn't really a recognition that, in fact, the weakness of the Haitian government had also been linked to the aid modalities and the way in which aid had been channeled over many, many years. So Haiti wasn't, um, you know, it hadn't been uh, a place where you had no aid. I mean, even before the, uh, the earthquake, you did have a lot of international aid going into Haiti, not quite at the same levels, but um, there was a lot of aid. But the way in which um, aid had been delivered in Haiti, in fact, didn't really support uh, the building of capacity to manage uh, resources and to deliver services either. Um, so there wasn't really... Uh, a lot of attention to you know the ways in which some of those difficulties could be worked through in this uh, uh, in the earthquake um, response, um, and in fact the the kind of bypassing of the state, uh, as I call it in the report, uh, was so dramatic that um, by the end of 2012, and this is f these are figures um, from the office of the special envoy uh, for uh, Haiti at the time. Um, the figures are that out from by the end of 2012, out of 6.4 billion US dollars dispersed in humanitarian and recovery aid, actually only less than 10% went to the government. And of course, far less even to uh, local NGOs, about 0.6%. Um, and the private sector was also, you know, dramatically marginalized. So, you know, th there was um, this consciousness about, well, we have to do something better, but how do you do anything better if some of the actors who are really should be the ones leading some of the change or certainly um, certainly being involved in, in driving part of that change uh, are in fact not part of the equation and are in fact left out. So there, there, there was, um, of course, uh, there were many attempts to develop uh, initiatives that would uh, look at more accountability to beneficiaries, you know, um, in, in making sure that in information was being given out to beneficiaries. Um, but that was within a context where, in fact, uh, you know, the reconstruction and the international efforts altogether was really, it was actually restricting interaction between internationals and, and uh, Haitians, not just beneficiaries, but Haitian civil society, Haitian, you know, private sector, everyone in Haitian society. So you had the security, um, you know, designation that was very high in Haiti uh, following the earthquake. I mean, some people think it was not justified, uh, really. Uh, you had the use of uh, English in many cluster um, in many of the cluster coordination meetings, which of course limited uh, participation um, from uh, the locals, as, and also security procedures just to actually get into the UN base, which really limited the number of uh, you know local actors who could actually come and participate um, in these meetings. So in fact, uh, you know, it led to somewhat of a fortification of the international community, um, and l led to many Haitians feeling that they were marginalized doubly, both by the Haitian state sort of being left out of you know uh, any of the official plans, but also left out by the international community. Um, 
And I know that Priscilla will touch much more on, on uh, shelter in, in Haiti, so I won't go into such detail, but really just to underline some of the key points of, uh, on, on, on that topic, which is that, um, you know, in fact, the, what was needed in Haiti was really a reconstruction response, uh, um, you know, a, a shelter reconstruction response, as well as other forms of reconstruction. But really what happened was an international humanitarian response, and it, ne it never really shifted out of that. Um, and if you look at, you know, the, um, well, this, you know, uh, 6.4 billion uh, that went in by the end of 2012, the majority of that went to humanitarian funding. And actually very little of that at all went into housing reconstruction, you know, about maybe uh, 200 million, a little bit more than 200 million went into actual housing reconstruction. Y and in, in spite of efforts, um, you know, to in fact have a kind of a, you know, commission for reconstruction, there was actually really little reconstruction that was being done. And the humanitarian system, the way that the, uh, interagency standing committee cluster system is designed in the way that shelter and housing was, um, you know, the, the way that that's sort of placed and located in that just really didn't help at all. It was incredibly uh, fragmented. You know, you had uh, four clusters that were dealing with something uh, related to shelter, whether it was camps or, you know, transitional shelter or early recovery. And early recovery, which was actually, uh, well, there was a sub subgroup, a working group within early recovery called Logement Cartier, which was the you know, return to the, uh, supporting return to the, the uh, yeah, to the neighborhoods of origin. And that, in fact, became the, the small place where reconstruction was being discussed. So the architecture here, I think, was it became very evident in Haiti that that itself, the international architecture, in fact, becomes um, an obstacle, in fact, to, in fact, to achieving uh, uh, and, you know, furthering the goals of um, building back better. So I'll just close there, and I'm sure that um, the other speakers and discussants will have uh, many points uh, on this. <laughs>